Good day, and uh, many thanks again to the for the organizers for inviting me to participate in this international workshop on advances in, in clean production. Obviously, it would have been fantastic to be in Ferrara to meet all of you in person, but given the global situation, I guess it is what it is. Uh, I'm Alan Brent, and I'm based at Victoria University of Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, where I head up the Sustainable Energy Systems Group. And the key question that we, that we and many in the energy sector have been asking ourselves is what this transition to uh, a low carbon economy is going to mean for, for materials uh, going forward. And today, I want to speak to that in general, the global level, but then focus a little bit more on what it means for our country uh, down here in, in the South Pacific. Uh, so what do we mean by this transition? So this is just a, a, a few slides uh, out of a, a report from the International Energy Agency that was released this year, where they looked at the role of critical minerals uh, in the clean energy transitions. And really, with uh, what we mean by uh, what we see going forward over the next uh, decades is really just a leap in terms of yeah more integration of of renewable energy uh, into the group uh, into the system and so we might see a threefold at the global level in terms of for example here solar pv and wind but that also also has implications for our electricity networks because a big issue with the transition obviously is, is to electrify as much as possible, but that means we need to expand our transmission systems and our dis distribution systems going forward. And especially so as an example, a key issue that we're all aware of is this, uh, the move to, to electrify our transportation. And yeah, that can be electric vehicles or it could be the hydrogen, but all of that means, especially if we're going green hydrogen as an example, we need more electricity. All right, so we need, to invest uh, a lot more in, in the overall uh, electricity generation and supply. And I don't need to emphasize that to this audience. And this is just a picture from uh, Watari and co colleagues, where yeah, you, very often we tend to think about direct flows in terms of energy and some of the materials that in this example, that might be necessary for, for our electric vehicles. But we all understand there are life cycle implications going upstream and so the indirect flows of energy that's required there and there's certain hidden flows as an example uh, waste material uh, that, that, is, that is generated so yeah as i said for, for this audience we all understand that we need to have a more holistic uh, understanding of what this uh, this transition might entail well the one thing uh, that we do see and again this is coming out of the iea report is as an example at the top there if we're going from our internal combustion engines to electric cars yeah we have we see a whole range of different minerals that will be needed or metals that will, will be needed obviously we know that we need lithium in, in our batteries but that also goes hand in hand with with nickel uh very importantly cobalt i'll mention that in in a in a couple of slides and also on our power power generation as we're going into into uh, renewables, yes, our conventional fuels rely less on some of these minerals, but for example, offshore wind, or onshore wind, solar PV, there's a whole range of different metals and becomes actually quite complicated in terms of what the content uh, of, of this, let's call it clean, clean energy or transition technologies would be as we're going forward. And very, uh, a very important aspect for today's discussion is that we'll, uh, we'll see and we are seeing a shift uh, in, in global supply chains uh, going from, from the conventional oil and gas where we had a minority of, uh, of countries really uh, on, on a global scale that participating in, in, in the upstream production of, of those fuels. But as we're going into clean technologies, we see a whole range of countries and different countries that are that are currently and will be uh, participating in the production of these different uh, minerals, and we can see certain countries, for instance, the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa, where much about two thirds of the cobalt production is is taking place, as an example. 
And what we see with this production is it becomes quite geographically concentrated. So as an example, if you uh, consider hydrogen as an example, and we're going down the fuel cell route, then South Africa, where I'm originally from, uh, is by, by, by far produces the, the most of the platinum group, group metals that goes into the fuel cells, as an example, right? Lithium, Australia, I mentioned cobalt in the DRC. Why is that complicated? Well, they've had the challenges in, in, the, in the past. And from an ethical production, the country has been quite uh, in, the, in the spotlight. Okay, so as we're going to the clean tech, yes, there we were using the tech. It's good. But if we start thinking about upstream, there are a range of sustainability issues, not only environmental, but also social uh, that becomes uh, quite critical. Uh, you would have remembered in the recent past, uh, from a rare earth perspective, you know, China, for obvious reason, they're producing most of those rare earths and they're, they're starting to hold on to it because it's such a strategic mineral to them. And so, what I'm saying here is that as we're going into the transitions, we're becoming quite reliant on very complicated uh values uh, chains that we need to manage and and consider going for uh, going forward uh and these are just uh two slides out of uh, from, from different colleagues again watari and, and, and colleagues that have looked at different scenarios for the electricity sector and the transport sector yes if you look up here you might think there's a there's a downshift but that's just because of the the fossil fuels that will reduce in the electricity sector for, for, for the generation. But you can see increases again in the amount of minerals that we need. Transportation, especially, we see this vast growth uh, in, in different minerals. Uh, Dietman and, and colleagues earlier this year published a paper, again, just looking at global electricity infrastructure. And uh, yeah, they just, as an example here, looked at steel stock, aluminium stock, and new denim, which is really important for, uh, for, for all of our electricity uh, infrastructure, transformers, cabling, etc. And what we see here is just growth. You know, as, we, as we're going forward and this transition occurs, it's just going to be in demand for all these materials. Is that sustainable? Well, this is a, a report that came out of uh, Finland um, uh, earlier this year. And again, this audience were, is well familiar with the fact that we, since the early 70s, when we've had that key report around limit, limits to growth, they just emphasize in this, this report that that's just not potentially sustainable, right? Because this is just a graph on the right hand side that looks at copper, obviously, again, a key, a key metal for, for our electricity infrastructure. And as this all grade, reduces, so does your energy intensity of actually extracting uh, that metal uh, it goes up, goes back to that slide I had about the secondary uh, or uh, indirect flows and, and uh, fuels that, that, that we need. All right, so upstream, we'll just need a lot more energy to have this clean tech uh, in the utilization phase. And yes, as you're going down here, uh, if you go moving, down the all grades, uh, you might have some tech improvements uh, to reduce this energy demand, but still you will always have this trend. And just a quotation out of that, that report, which is really uh, important, recycling cannot be done on products that have not yet been manufactured. So yes, over the next decade, we are going to invest in, into our electrification, into our renewable energies, into our transport, electrifying our transportation, but it's going to take decades for a lot of that, those products to actually come to the end of their life and become available for, for recycling. And, I, and we see this going back to the IEA report that if you look at recycled input rates for some of these key uh, metals, that's pretty much been stagnant, right? And so even though we've seen this growth, input rates are, are, are constant and that's just a reflection that recycling is just keeping up uh, with growth, all right? So, there's no way in the, over the next decade that we would necessarily be able to do, do that with, uh, or, or from a circular economy get to, to the point uh, that we have substantial uh, input for, from our recycled material. So this is a real challenge 
uh, for us going going forward and, and again one of the key issues for, for us down here in Aotearoa New Zealand. Which brings me to, to our country, just a little bit of a, a background for, from an from a energy perspective. Uh, yep, we're down in the South Pacific, we, uh, there's a number of islands, but mainly two major islands. There are a few smaller ones, for example, Stewart Island here, uh, Great Barrier Island and, and Waikiki Island that, that's populated and Chatham Islands are our way over uh, out west in the, in the, in, uh, east in the South Pacific. But largely two, two main islands. Um, you know, we're fortunate. We have a bit of, uh, like some, some other countries like Norway, Iceland, we, uh, we have the benefit of being largely or largely having a, a, a green uh, electricity grid. Uh, we're around about 80% uh, percent of our capacity is, is renewable. Uh, the South Island is 100% uh, renewable. That's where the majority of our lakes and our hydropower schemes are, although the Waikato uh, in the central upper North Island is also one of our uh, big hydropower schemes. But we have the majority of our generation, or our Call it base load, if you will. It's not really base load. It's uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a dispatchable hydropower, right? It's generated down here in the South Island, and what we see with the dash line here is a high voltage DC line. New Zealand was one one of the first countries to install uh, such a such a line to link up uh, these two two islands because I, the most of the demand is up here in the north in Auckland, as, uh, as some of you would be well aware. That's our our main big city. And so, yeah, so we have this warped uh, situation where we have a, where a lot of our generation is quite far away uh, from our demand. A lot of the wind uh, growth going forward, and there's about 3,000 megawatts. And again, just thinking that we're just below about 9,000 megawatts in total capacity. And an additional about 400 megawatts of, of bio uh, cogeneration, biomass. Um, there's about 3,000 megawatts uh, that's already gone through uh, environmental consent or resource consent, as we, we, we call it. Uh, and that's largely down in, on the south of the North Island and you know, close to where we are here in, in Wellington. But the point is that generation is quite a far away from the, the demand. Um, Although some of our solar developments will be up here just north of uh, north of Auckland going forward, and so as we're going in electrifying uh, our economy, uh, similar to what we've seen in other places of the world, it's not again it's not only the generation, but it's this additional transmission uh, systems and uh, additional investment that we have we need to make into our distribution systems to accommodate for 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 uh, electrifying the transportation and so on is a is a key issue for us. Earlier this year, and as I mentioned right at the beginning, we have our, our net zero carbon bill act uh, to 2050. And that act uh, facilitated uh, the, uh, the Climate Change Commission that came into being uh, late last year. And they did uh, uh, some modeling work and they provided an uh, an advice to our government. They don't make their own policy, but they provide an advice to, to or their mandate is not to develop policy, but they are, they need to advise government. And this is a report that they released this year, looking at the low emissions future of Aotearoa. And yeah, what do we need to do? They need to they, come up with a, a, an emission budget and there's an emission reduction plan that comes uh, following this ad advice. But no surprises. Yeah, so I mean, EV, uh, they would like, at least on the, on the light vehicles, that we get to run about 100% of our uh, light vehicle fleet uh, should be EV. Heavy fleet, it's, the jury's out. Um, we have some hydrogen development and trucks that are coming into the economy later this year. We have our first... Uh, a network of hydrogen uh, refueling stations uh, that's that's being being commissioned. On the generation side, obviously, uh, we don't see a lot more development with with the hydro. Uh, there is one big uh, 
dam or lake uh, that's being considered for pump storage, the Onslow. Uh, that's, but largely there is, given some of the environmental concerns, uh, we don't see a lot more development on, on the hydro side. Some geothermal, uh, but not too much. But yeah, it's going to be a lot more solar, a lot more uh, wind, and we see some biomass uh, and so on going forward. And really what we, what we need is in the order of uh, two to three times uh, the, the amount of electricity generation to, to, to meet that. So yeah, we're sitting around 40, uh, just over 40 at the moment. This is coming from our TransPower, which is our national utility that's, uh, that's responsible for the transmission system or the backbone of the, of, of the grid and, and, and managing the generators and ma managing the demand. Uh, so yeah, as we, again, they've looked at what the Climate Change Commission has said uh, and, and their different scenarios uh, and, it's great, we see this reduction in, in emissions going forward, but it's this graph of the, the right-hand side here, and this is conservative. Some, of the, some estimates have put this up to about 90 terawatt hours of demand that we will need in a year coming from about the 40. So yeah, as I said, at least we need to aim for doubling uh, our, our capacity in, in our grid. And this is, uh, fed into also a, a report from Transpower earlier this year, looking at the transmission planning going forward. And we understand more or less what needs to be done to expand the grid. But a key issue uh, that we're asking ourselves, what, what, is, what are the material implications and where are we going to get those materials? And yeah, what, 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 what is our contribution going to be to those increasing complex value change that I mentioned uh, earlier on. And some key considerations uh, that sort of flow from that is this, these are just some of uh, the key messages uh, from two, two publications that, uh, that really resonate with uh, the Aotearoa New Zealand context, right? So yes, we are pretty green in terms of green, uh, in terms of our grid. So yeah, so the indirect emissions of you know, our low carbon strategies might be modest compared to impact of avoiding fossil fuels, right, in other economies, but they might become more relevant in a low carbon economy. So that's really for other economies that, that have to transition from fossil fuels to the green, uh, to, to greening their, their, their generation and then expanding electrification. Well, we're already there. So we don't, we don't necessarily have a big issue uh, with this transition from fossil fuels, but we're already reasonably green and as, as we transition the rest of the economy in terms of electrifying transport but also process heat etc and in, in the built environment these 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 indirect emissions actually become much more important than our direct emissions another uh, issue that other authors have raised is as we uh, have these ambition ambitious national targets for reducing our direct emissions there might be substantial global emissions upstream. Again, those value chains and these more complicated and more complex uh, minerals and so on that we will need for, for our transition. So, so what, has, what has sort of been done is that we've, there's been some uh, aspects of our circular economy strategies that have been analyzed, but nowhere near comprehensively enough around what it, uh, our clean energy transition would mean. Recycling has come up. Uh, as, as really uh, being quite critical and that we need a long-term long -term strategy. And this is just, uh, just in the last uh, few months, some initiatives that have come out of our industry, specifically a battery industry group, that's looking at circular product stewardship and focusing on, on our lithium-ion batteries. Yeah, at the moment, you know, there's about 30,000 EVs in uh, on the roads in, in, in New Zealand, but that's projected to grow to 30,000 by, um, uh, by, by, or not to, so we're looking at about 1,000 uh, lithium ion batteries uh, coming to the end of life at the moment, but by 2030, we're going to be looking at 30,000 uh, a year coming to, to, to the end of their lives. And there's all this talk about the second life of those batteries 
um, in terms of stationary applications, but still, some point or another, you need to deal with them. So we need a long-term strategy and realizing that we're quite a small but connected economy in our Oceania region. So yeah, we would have to link, uh, think about linking up with Australia and the rest of this, the Asia Pacific in terms of participating in, in, in circular economy activities. Uh, also, it has been done. So yeah, I mean, future energy systems have been have been modeled. We have all these energy system models. We have integrated assessment models where we've looked at optimization, general equilibrium, simulation, and system wide models, uh, looking at technological, economic, environmental changes, etc. But from our perspective, uh, material cycles have largely been overlooked and they really misrepresent prospective life cycle emissions. So how do our life cycle emissions uh, really look for, uh, going forward in a more dynamic way? Um, there have been obviously been studies done on estimating the material demand for these low carbon, uh, low carbon transitions, but as we saw this one a, a few slides back, these are mainly focused on a global scale, and we haven't really seen any of that uh, at, at the national scale. So if we look at those that have looked at, at, at the global situation, there's been different approaches, looking at uh, system-wide models where we integrated with input-output models or integrating the life cycle models, or where we look at physical actual flow of materials. So we've looked at dynamic material flow stock models. But yeah, we need to think about how do we integrate uh, these different models to get a more cohesive and comprehensive understanding about what the implications will be for our transition. And this is really what the focus is of our group at the moment. Uh, we see the need to develop some national models that are integrated, as I said, uh, that look at the dynamic material supply demand and prospective life cycle emissions for our low carbon strategy, because we do realize that we need to understand the national implications in, because we are part of a global economy, but also on the global context because we need to take responsibility uh, being global citizens. Uh, so Jim Hinckley and I are, are heading up this, this research and we are supervising Isabella Pacelli uh, that has recently started up a PhD in this space. So if you are interested uh, to, to, to connect up, uh, either send me an email or please uh, send Isabella an email. She'll, she'll be grateful to, to, to rub shoulders uh, with other researchers that, that are out there thinking about the, the space. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak to this audience. Uh, I, I would welcome any, uh, any feedback interaction going forward and Hopefully, within the next year or so, we will be able to meet up in person. All right, enjoy the rest of the conference.